Okay. So I hope we, you, our coordinator has started the recording. So welcome everyone to the Lead for Pollinators Creating Pollinator Habitat webinar series. I am Michelle Colopy, Executive Director of Lead for Pollinators. And our webinars are supported by the following sponsors. Hispanic Marketing and Public Relations. Visit hispanicmpr.com for interviews, presentations, and more. Beauty Beyond Belief Seeds specializes in wildflower seeds, heirloom vegetable seeds, grass seeds, regional wildflower seeds, and special use wildflower mixes, including their line of four grape pollinator mixes. Shop for your garden and pollinator habitat for the Western U.S. planting zones at bbbseed.com. Two Million Blossoms Magazine will awaken readers to the vast diversity of pollinating insects and animals. This quarterly magazine will delight, entertain, and name those well-adapted creatures buzzing through our world. Because the more we know about pollinators, the better we can provide habitat. Subscribe today using the discount code word LEAD and receive $5 off the subscription rate for one year. Visit 2millionblossoms.com. OPN Seed has partnered with LEAD for Pollinators with pollinator mixes created for beekeepers and anyone who wants to attract and support pollinators. You can get native seeds for Eastern US planting zones at OPN Seed. Go to the Lead for Pollinators website, donor affiliations page and select support our cause to view featured seed selections and a portion of sales generated from our website will help support our work. Did you miss a webinar? You can view these topics through our pay-per-view access. Visit our website for the recorded Login to Learn webinars and select a topic today. Our speaker for our series today is Carol Yamada. Carol lived in the shadow of an old oak tree for years and when it fell, she eventually converted her yard into a pollinator garden with the new sunlight. Although she loves all the pretty flowers, the complexity of bees and their uncertain future was more compelling. She started studying bees through the Oregon Bee Project Master Melitologist Program. A melitologist is an entomologist specializing in the study of bees. Carol now tromps around Oregon cataloging native bee populations. She recently became a member of the Speakers Bureau for Bee City USA. Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA are initiatives of the Society for Invertebrate Conservation, works with cities and college and university campuses across the country, providing a framework for communities to come together to support pollinators. Whether you're a backyard gardener, city manager, professor, professor, student, or just someone interested in pollinator conservation, our speaker tonight will give you the tools to help mobilize your community to conserve pollinators. Please welcome Carol Yamada. Hi, it's really nice to be here. Thank yes. you so much for inviting me. Yes, so if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Wonderful. And cursor over there, it's being obstinate. I apologize for that. There we go. And uh, is that working? Uh, that is, there we go. It's a little slow. There we okay. go. Hi. Okay, well, I'm really glad to be here and talk to you about B City and B Campus USA. There are ways, I mean, if we have a pollinator garden, you know how cool it is to have a garden that makes all the bees happy and makes you happy because you have more vegetables and more fruits and more trees and everything's great. You're keeping chemicals out of the environment and your pollinators feel safe there. Well, I don't know if they feel safe there, but they are safe there. But eventually you look beyond your fence and realize your garden isn't big enough. How do you get it bigger? How do you scale up? And that's what B City and B Campus USA are trying to help people do. 
It is an initiative of the Xerces Society, which has been around now for 50 years and is the largest nonprofit pollinator conservation program in the world. And the way they can stretch their resources that thin is they harness the knowledge of scientists and combine it with the enthusiasm of, of community members to implement their conservation programs. This is pretty similar to what the campus does and Bee City USA do, is they bring communities together to sustain native pollinators. It was uh, started in 2012 by a beekeeper in North Carolina, Phyllis Stiles, and then eventually Bee Campus became another affiliate process. And it got grew so big that uh, a few years ago it became part of the Xerces Society umbrella. Everyone who becomes an affiliate uh, makes promises that they will have an abundance of native plants and nesting sites and reduce pesticide use. So this is just my feel good bee so that we can all get into our bee frame of mind. Isn't it cute? It's my screensaver. Anyhow, <laughs> your day is over and now you can think about bees. So I'm gonna talk about the importance of bees uh, as pollinators and the challenges that they're facing, and then the structure of Bee City and Bee Campus USA, and how being an affiliate could be uh, something that works for your organization to help your pollinators. When people say the word bee, they usually think of honeybees. They're like the only bee most people know. I think it's because it's always been on the honey jar since we were kids, honeybee. But, you know, they're not native. They came from Europe in the 1600s. The uh, colonists brought them over because they needed the beeswax for candles, as well as the honey for sweetener and for mead, which was kind of how you got through the long, cold winters in the 1600s. Honeybees are the number one managed bee in the world. They're used everywhere uh, to pollinate orchards and crops. And they're really good for that for a few reasons. One is they are social bees. So they will live in these boxes and they'll build honeycombs and you can carry them around so they're portable and they're generalists. You open the box and they're gonna jump out and pollinate whatever's out there. So they're really handy for agricultural use. But they're completely different than our native bees because native bees for one, they're not generalist and they're not transportable. They grew up, they evolved in this biome across the United States, and they need the flowers and the plants that are there. In fact, 30% of them maybe are, need specific flowers. They can't even be generalists. If you know bumblebees, they can go lots of places, but some bees eat, eat lots of plants, pollinate lots of plants. But a lot of bees, they need very specific flowers to survive, and when the flowers are gone, so are they. Also, Native bees don't nest, they don't create honeycombs because they don't make honey. They live individually in the ground or in uh, trees or little wood crevices. And so they have to just, they just live where they live. We can't cart them around. That's why we say that uh, keeping bees in an effort to conserve, keeping honeybees in an effort to conserve native bees is the same as keeping chickens in the hope of conserving native songbirds just different animals. So to be very clear, Bee City USA neither encourages nor discourages beekeeping of honeybees. They're not, you know, a lot of our bee cities and campuses raise honeybees and have honeybees and we love honeybees and we love honey beekeepers but the initiative is focusing on native bees who don't have a lot of protection. So why are we focusing on bees? I mean, there's lots of pollinators, right? Well, there's all of these on the screen. Plus there's hummingbirds that come and get a face full of pollen and go to the next flower and pollinate. There's bats, there's even lemurs. I don't even know what a lemur is, but it's a pollinator somewhere. <laughs> so there's all these pollinators, but they're not as effective as bees. And the reason for that is completely biological. Here's some of our 3,600 native bees. Of course, they make them all the same size, but on this photo, but they're all different sizes. But as you can see, they're also all hairy. And that's because bees, these um, 
solitary bees need to be able to transport pollen from flowers to their nest. And if you know how they nest, they have like little cells in the wood or cells underground, and they put in a pollen ball and they lay an egg on it and they close up the cell. And that's all the larva has to live on. So for the perpetuation of the species, they totally need to be able to carry lots of pollen over to their nest. So here's a little longhorn bee. She's on a black-eyed Susan. And you can see she's, she's really packing on the pollen. And the stuff on her legs will go to her nest. But the rest of it that's on her bottom and on her wings and on her abdomen and her head, that's all going to fall off when she goes to the next flower. It just does. And so that's what pollination is. And she will go around all day pollinating flowers by collecting uh, pollen for her babies. Her babies to be. She never even gets to meet them. This is a leaf cutter bee. It carries its pollen on its abdomen, just like a mason bee. You know, mason bees are like 98% effective pollinators. Almost every flower they touch gets pollinated. They're like superstars. And this is a bumblebee, and uh, it's in my yard. It, it came out of this foxglove, and they're so covered with pollen. Pollen just gets everywhere, and they have to groom themselves to get it off so they can fly. So there's just a lot of pollen hanging around on bees, and that's why they're superstars of pollination. So why do we care about pollinators? Well, they did co-evolve with the plants, and the plants need them to 85% of our plants need them to carry pollen from one plant to the next so that they can reproduce. And when they reproduce, what they get is our food, our nuts and berries and fruits and all this stuff that is pollinated by bees. That's a lot of stuff. And if you're, they say like one in three bites if a food is from a bee. And if you're a vegetarian, I, that's like 50% maybe it comes from a bee. Even meat comes from bees, in a sense, because there's alfalfa bees that pollinate alfalfa, so they feed the cows, so then they make the meat. And so they say that the value of pollination is estimated, uh, crops that are pollinated is between 18 and $27 billion, but I don't know how you really put a, a price tag on cherries and apples. <laughs> I mean, whoa, what would life be without that? So we care about pollinators, because they produce food for us. And they produce food for all these guys too. There's the, they're considered a keystone piece species for the whole food chain. If the bees aren't there, everyone suffers. There'll be a, like a, a domino effect of things that can't get enough food. So that's why we care about pollinators for everybody's food. But you've probably heard that they're kind of disappearing. There's a lot of things in the papers and uh, newspaper articles and magazine articles and all these studies that show that the um, number of bees, or not just bees, pollinators, insects in general, is declining. And they're getting these numbers by comparing bug collections from the 1800s and the 1900s and now, and finding that some of the bugs just aren't here anymore. And but some of them aren't here in any numbers anymore. So, Globally, like 40% of pollinator species may be at risk of extinction in the coming years. I mean, that's almost half. And in North America, 25% of the bumblebee species are declining. So, you know, I was looking up some different states because I don't know where y'all are from. But uh, in, Boston, in Massachusetts, they figured that they've lost three species of bumblebees alone in the last century. And we'll probably lose three more species in the next decade, leaving them with just four species of bees in the state of Massachusetts. So how is this happening? It's happening because of stressors in the environment. You know, you know what they are, habitat loss and degradation, spring poisons on what's there, diseases and pathogens, and climate change. So there's every reason now to just turn off your computer and go home and be sad. But no, no, good news, there are solutions. <laughs> Sorry, I don't need to be glib about this. It is serious. And um, Xerces Society, 
um, Bee City USA says there are solutions because many of these species that are at risk are actually living in our yards, in our neighborhoods, and in our cities. And we don't have to do a lot to change how they're impacted by human activities. We, we do have to do small things like plant the plants that they need, take care, make sure that they have habitat, take care of how we rake our leaves, how we deal with pests and that kind of thing. So we can make these changes and urban and suburban areas can make a big difference in the outcome for bees. And here's a quote that I got from a Xerxes email last week, which inspired me. It said, we think that if we take the right steps, we can stop and even reverse some of this trend. So even reverse is like, really? We can have more bees in 10 years than we have now? That would be so awesome. This is a little chart on bee diversity. How many species do you impact with your garden or your park uh, policies? It says here that there's like 20 to 30 different species of bees in your garden. That's, that's a lot. So the next slide I'm gonna show you is not from Xerxes, even though it says so on the slide. I was doing a little research and this is just, this is from Chicago, Illinois University where they did a study on bumblebees in, the, in this area. And it was one of those very scientific ones where they specifically did the same thing two years in a row. And they found that the most abundant species of bumblebees were find, found in planted meadows, planted hay fields, planted urban areas, and planted roadsides. Those are all things that we can affect. And the less abundant species, even more so, planted roadsides, planted urban areas, planted meadows. So I just threw that in, don't tell Xerxes, but because it inspired me to find out that, yeah, you know, you really can make a difference in your own yard. So Xerxes has the plan for how you do that. And it's pretty much to reverse with the declining, the things that caused the decline in the first place. So increase the availability of native flowers. If you have less area, just plant way more. And create more gardens, of course, more spaces that are planted. Just plant the bejeebers out of it. Provide appropriate nesting substrates. Uh, they're round nesters and they will nest in your house. If you have, if you have mason bees, you know they will nest anywhere in little crevices. And they also in stems in plants. And so how you cut your plants back actually makes a difference on whether or not you have bees nesting or if you've destroyed a bee's nesting spot. And so educating people, that's two slides down. <laughs> the third one is find alternatives to harmful pesticides. Uh, having an integrated pest management plan. We don't have to spray in order to get rid of pests. And then the last one is to educate and spread awareness. And if you're here, that's probably something that you're really doing already now and are dedicated to. And thank you for that. This is the current cities and campuses that are part of B-City USA. And they are all over the country but there's not enough of them. There's a lot of dots there. So you're probably thinking, I can help. How do I get started? How do I become a B-City or a B-Campus? At least I hope you're thinking about that. Um, so there's some commitments that we ask from all of the affiliates. And the first one is create your team. And these commitments have to be accomplished every year. It doesn't mean you have to change your team every year, but create your uh, committee to establish it. And these are like the movers and the shakers and the fun makers. And they will be certain that um, your bee city or campus carries out their commitments and moves, uh, integrates what we do into the larger community. If you're a bee city committee, then it's city staff, which of course the city staff person would be the liaison with Bee City USA, uh, parks and rec staff, engaged citizens, and local experts. So, the committee can be lodged in the parks and rec staff. Sometimes it, B-City actually originate in parks and recs. They just, the cities decide to do it themselves. But sometimes it's located outside of the city itself in a local nonprofit organization, like a 
conservation group or garden club or something like that. So there's different ways you can set up your, your committee to work with with cities. Every city is different, and so every solution will be unique. And then the engaged citizens, of course, is a really important part. You need people who are passionate about pollinators. City people are wonderful, but they're busy. And so if you have pollinator people who are really into it, then they can keep things moving. Because sometimes you, there's roadblocks in a city, things will just stall. And engaged citizens can, can work around those things and keep things moving and come up with great ideas and inform the city of like wonderful projects and get everybody involved. And so those are really important people as well as your local experts. And when you make your committee, think big. Now, it can be beekeeping associations, it can be artists, it can be dog walkers in your park, it can be whoever you find that's like really into this and understands that there's an issue that needs to be solved. If you're on a campus, it's a different organization, we'll think, right? You need faculty, staff, admin, students. And of course, people in the landscape and grounds crew should be part of this because you can't just say, you know, they need to be there, they're integral. And uh, although students, we love students and students are great, they cannot be the, the only chair of a committee because they're going to move on and graduate. So you need to have at least as a co-chair, someone from faculty or staff. Commitment number two is make some habitat. Using the rule, the uh, guidelines for how to make good habitat, you, you build habitat every year you create new habitat or enrich old habitat or expand habitat or do something so that you're creating more space for your bees, for your pollinators to live a healthy life. It can be here like this is around buildings. And this is in a park I walk through every day. Uh, it's a, I live in the countryside, but I live in the middle of three different bee cities. And this bee city, this park was just blackberries. There was nothing there but blackberries and wetland. They tore out all the blackberries and put in these beautiful camas. And right now it's in full bloom and it's gorgeous. So you can have all sorts of different kinds of projects and restoration ideas for your city and your campus. Number three is create an integrated pest management plan. This sounds like the most complex because you know, it's pesticides. It's how you get rid of your pests. And just so you know, you don't have to have, we don't expect you to have it in place when you become a bee city or bee campus. And that's one thing Xerces is good for. It has plans you can use as templates. It has ideas for you. It has resources for you. They will help you put together your plan to, um, the plan outlines appropriate uses of pesticides and a plan for using alternative pesticides to control pests. I'm spending a little time on that because I've been speaking to different people who have or have tried to get their B Campus USA affiliation. And this is often a sticky point because people don't want to change how they're doing things or they don't understand that they, there's a better way. And so if when you're presenting to people, you don't have to say, we're getting rid of all of our pesticides tomorrow. It's like, we are integrating a plan over time. And then one, another one of the bee cities that I live in is Wilsonville, Oregon. I don't live in next to it. And they became very famous because mm -hmm. a few years ago, there was this Target parking lot. And uh, it, the, the Target parking lot had linden trees in the parking lot to give shade. And it was covered with aphids. And these aphids were dropping honeydew on the cars big time. So people were complaining because their cars were all sticky and they couldn't, they didn't want to touch it. They didn't want to clean their windshield. So the target people called the exterminators and they came out to spray the trees. But the trees were in full bloom and were covered with bumblebees. And that day, 50,000 bumblebees dropped into the parking lot dead. As soon as they touched the neonicotinoids, they died. So that was 300 colonies, boom, in one day. So um, now Wilsonville is a bee city and they have a pest management plan and anyone, any subcontractors or any people working in the city 
pay attention to the rules so that that will never happen again. And this is an easy one, commitment number four, recommended native plant list. You can go to xerces.org and download one based on your zip code and it's all the native plants in your area. Or well, you may already have it done. Hmm? You may already have your own native plant list and you just edit it. And, these, and so like if you have a parks department, they will decide which plants that they want to put into their landscaping and that will be their native plant list. But more importantly, where do you get those plants? So they'll also list the, the nurseries where you can get the plants. And that's not just for their staff. They put it on the website so that the citizens can also see the um, recommended plants and where you can get them. Number five, put up your sign. Uh, you know how important that is. You have to broadcast what you're doing so that people go, I live in a bee city. Ah. What is a bee city? <laughs> and then they'll say, oh, that's what we're supposed to do. In order to be a bee city, we need to, we need to let our yards get messy. Now I know. Um, so we give the artwork for the, for the local signs, but we also ask that you do local signage because wherever you live, you have different pollinators that you're trying to protect. Maybe you have monarch butterflies and maybe what you're doing is planting milkweed or maybe you, whatever, whoever you're protecting, just make it really personal to what you're doing. I think that's the, pretty much everything is make it really personal to where you live and what you're doing and which pollinators you're working with. Number six, report and renew. So every year by the end of February, after you've been a member for a full calendar year, we ask you to fill out one of these templates of what you've done. It's kind of your brag list. This is what we did. And this is who showed up. And you use pictures and you share what you did and your victories. And this way, B City knows what you've done. And you have a good record of what you've done. And other people can get ideas from what you've done because these are all posted on the website. Yay. So right there, um, it took me a while to find it. And so that's why I'm posting it here. You just type renewal reports in the search engine and everybody's comes up. And so you can see what everyone's doing and get really good ideas and um, kind of share with, with everyone. Also up here, if you do a drop down of Bee City USA, there'll be a list of all the affiliates. Same with Bee Campus USA, all the affiliates. So, you know, if you have questions and you're doing your due diligence and trying to figure out if this will work for you, you can contact every other affiliate to see, ask questions and they'll help you out. If you're a city or county, it's a little different because you um, have to implement or change your policies and plans to be pollinator conscious. For instance, you're planting and pesticide reduction plans. And if you're a city or a county, then you need to have pollinator events. They can be full-blown parades downtown where everybody dresses up like a bee, or they can just be a table at a farmer's market or a coloring contest. It, again, this is something like, what can you do? How many do you want to do? What is your committee inspired to do? Do you have a lot of artists? Do you have a lot of bee nerds? You know, Whatever you have, then you come up with something that works for you. If you're a campus, well, Hallelujah, you're already teaching stuff. <laughs> so what you do is you incorporate pollinator conservation into your existing programs, into your horticulture or your landscape design or whatever kind of things work. I, uh, I took, um, we, I have a bee city camp, a bee campus next door. And I took my Mason bee classes there. And I took them actually from a master gardener and so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can work with other groups who are doing the same thing you are and that's considered one of their events. And they did, they've done other things, like they're really into beekeeping. So I spoke to the lady who's their bee campus person. She teaches beekeeping for the last 20 years. She's awesome. And uh, one of their unusual class projects was the robotics team put together a demonstration beehive for them so you could like lift the 
the hive and, or the doors and see inside and then close it. And so the robotics team got to work on that. So, you know, whatever you decide to do, it can just be fun. Okay, so what are the benefits of affiliation? Well, there are all these things of uh, saving the planet and heightening of awareness of biological diversity and support small local businesses. You know, like people who grow ladybugs and helping people become more aware of where their food comes from, how far away their food comes from, how food happens, where it grows, and just all of the things that, that just make pollinators more important to people and creates a synergy of awareness with other groups and a, a language in your organization or in your campus in your city about pollinators. You know, so those are the benefits because you have the signs and you have the events. So people start to really understand what's going on. But beyond that, you also have in your back pocket, the Xerxes Association organization. So if you need help, uh, you, can, you have someone you can call and they're specialists and they know your area and they know a lot. They give out fact sheets, webinars, monthly newsletters. They've been having Zoom meetings with different cities on how to work on their pesticide issues. And so you have kind of a, oh, a little secret weapon there. And so I called up a few people who are the um, B-City people in the cities, or what, the B-City liaison. I said, okay, so where I live, everybody's in a tree city already. It's pretty green out here in Oregon, you know, we're all like that. And so I said, so what would you say is the benefits of affiliation? What do you think it is? And one guy said, I like the signs. <laughs> I, was like, I like to be able to brag that I'm in a B city. But then he went on to say something that everybody else said too. It says, it just gives us focus. It gives us accountability. We know that every year we have to accomplish our commitments. And so we just get set in when you know in the beginning of the year we have our meeting we map it out and we do it and i think that's really important because they don't it's not like they wouldn't do it but this just makes it focused and it's like wow they should put that on the slide i think that's a great one so then how can i apply i know you're there right <laughs> so it's really simple how you apply you form your committee you complete a simple, simple online application. It's on the website. And then you go through your approval process, which varies you know, depending on where your city or campus is at in, in their evolution towards becoming a B city or B campus. And then you pay the application fee. And they have the notes on here is remind people that this is a long-term project, not a race. Don't feel like you have to run in there and do everything. It's just, you know, actually it's, it's like a garden. You go in, you prepare the ground, you plant the flowers, all that kind of stuff. It's the same thing as becoming a bee city or a bee campus. You just get started and it moves along. So pay application fee. The application fees are scaled. They top out at $500 for bee campus and the same thing for bee cities. So it's not a really expensive thing. Then again, they have this oh, fabulous website and it's got all the things I told you today and a zillion things more plus webcams and casts and um, YouTube videos and everything you need to know about B-City USA and more. And there's one more cute bee I wanna share. This is Declan. He's my next door neighbor and he comes with me to bee events and he dresses up like a bee and he passes out pamphlets. And he just reminds me, you know, that who I'm doing this for is two and three and 10 generations down. So we need pollinators and we need kids. <laughs> so don't forget them on your committee. So thank you very much for your attention and um, your interest in Bee City and Bee Campus. If there's anything I can answer, I'd be happy to do so. Right. Well, that was wonderful, uh, Carol. Thank you. And certainly it's always good to know the fees because that's what cities and other groups will want to know the cost. And I think that's highly reasonable. And, you know, I do like the, the comment you made that, that somebody else had said that the being a B-City USA keeps you focused. 
Now, I, I have heard that um, becoming a tree city USA is typically what happens that cities become a tree city and then they kind of are used to a process like that. So it's easier to become a bee city after you've been a tree city. It is, that's what I've heard too. Yeah, it's kind of the entree. It's it's rather like in beekeeping that if you're a you know beekeeping people and chicken people often come together, <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes beekeepers become chicken people as well as and the same with the chicken <laughs> folks. So I know because I, I was taking some notes and I think certainly education is is key. I know when I've dealt with um, some pollinator habitat projects that I've put in um, and, and Terry, our coordinator, has worked on those as well, that education is really key in setting those expectations, especially for cities. Because I've even talked to a local council person when they were doing a kind of a sewer recl reclamation area and it was a stormwater drainage area, so they planted uh, plants that could live in a wet area. But they were, the council, probably didn't listen. They thought it would be this perfect bloom in the first year. So I think it's important in these habitat projects that hopefully the bee city has that process of educating folks of it's not going to be perfect the first year. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that we have to set those expectations, I think. Definitely. Uh, I don't know if bee city in particular has like a pamphlet about that mm. but it's kind of up to the people who are in the cities to do that okay. and then you know there's ways to get around that like the seed mixes they well, always yes yeah you can look pretty yeah because we had uh, dave rudell from opn seed talk about planting um habitats and he certainly i i had him specifically do one on setting appropriate expectations and understanding the first year you might get those fast growing and that's part of that seed mixture. Second year, you've got a lot of the perennials starting to come up, which may shade out those first year plants. You may never see those first year plants again. <laughs> so, but it's setting those expectations because you have, and, and I think that's where the signage, you mentioned signage, so that as people start this, they've got to have that signage to educate people what's going on because they will think of it, and you said that phrase, that it's a messy yard. See, and, and I took some umbrage of that one because I don't think my yard is messy. I think it's I'm pretty. sorry. I know, that's okay. I think, <laughs> I think in America, we are so used to this scalped yard look that everybody has this cut your yard at less than three inches, and that's what it is every week. And we're just so used to that kind of, I almost call it a marine haircut from the 50s. But it, we have to just change that mindset that it's not messy, it's floral, it's diverse. Um, so I, I definitely see that as a cultural change. And it's like, you put your first step in and that's the B city signs. And people will drive by those 20 times and never see them. Eventually right. it'll sink in and they go, well, what does that mean? And then you can begin the next stage of talking about, well, protecting pollinators, they need this. Right. And yeah. who are you gardening for, just you or for? you know, something bigger. Right. But it's, it's a process. It is. Yeah. And, and I think the signs are so important. I had some folks in my community call and complain about what they were doing in the national park. We have the Cuyahoga Valley National Park up here and they were putting in new pollinator habitat. But in a sense, they did it backwards. It was the wildflowers, the weeds themselves were all blooming. And it looked gorgeous to the average person. They were used to that all blooming, but they wanted to put in some trees. They wanted to take out some invasives and put in new flowers. The sign it printed after they started killing what was there. So you had instant complaints from the community going, what is it the park is doing? And they really should have not done the killing until they put up the signs. To educate folks. So I think that's important too as you plan the process for your community habitat. The education has got to come first. That's a really good point. Um, so you know and, and it's interesting we had a, a researcher here in Ohio works out of Ohio State University Mary Gardner and she's been doing habitat plantings in urban areas on vacant lots. 
But in the end, she, she forgot to talk to neighborhood leaders first because she did a lot of plantings on neighborhood lots, but in urban areas, people get afraid of tall plants. Who's hiding in there? And then other people started dumping trash in there. <laughs> so again, it's that education is key before we just go in and decide to change a, a landscape. Education and working together. Yeah. I tend to be like this lone ranger kind of person. And I thought, beep of seed bombs. What a great idea. Seed bombs. I'll just go and broadcast seed everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And then the next time you go by, it's cut down or poisoned because you didn't get permission to do that. Right. Like, oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes. So that's the coalition building and having like a broad network of people on your committee to approach with things in lots of different ways. Right. Yeah. And to get that community buy-in so that it isn't just gardeners and beekeepers. It is, as you said, artists. It is business owners. Um, certainly in my community, we have something called the Devil Strip, which I talked about that in a previous presentation, which is a tree lawn for some cities. So it's the space between the sidewalk and the street. Mm. And in my community, everybody plants that. And that's a great place to put pollinator plants. But at the same time, you have to educate people what is there and why it's growing. And especially, you know, why is your goldenrod four feet tall? <laughs> because it likes the crappy soil in the uh, Devil Strip. Now, I've noticed something with Bee City USA. You folks have been posting on social media a no mow May. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that uh, at all? I actually don't know much about that. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, on, it's on social media, and I know a couple of other groups have pushed it because certainly May um, is that dandelion time. Um, and, you know, you were talking about uh, pollinators living in the stems of plants and this is actually the first year I, I just, I cut the stems down at the base, just I had an issue with my city, but I left the stems on the habitat. So, and everything's growing around them. I don't need to pick them up because some of those native bees don't come out until about now. Is that, is that right? Or maybe a little later? Yeah, you know, this is, uh, one of the things I've gone around and around with people about, uh, just personally for my pollinator garden, it's like, well, when do you take them out and when do you leave them and who, who uses them when? And actually, the hollow stems are being used now by the little bees who are out foraging now and they're going to be nesting in there. And they're not going to come out again until next February or March. Okay. So if you leave the stems up, you have to leave them up for a year. Wow. Okay. Well, my city won't allow that. So my... <laughs> but how high? They're just four inches high. Okay. You can do that. And so pretty much that gets, like you say, obscured by the leaves. And right. okay. it's not a big deal. It just looks kind of like a sleeping plant. Right. Yes. But I have been quite surprised this year because I was also trying to control my, my habitat starting to get out of control. <laughs> so that I was trying to, um, in a sense, force them to grow back into the yard and not so much toward my driveway. But they have popped up through the pile of leaves I put on them. I even put some newspaper over it. They didn't care. They are growing through. They want to live. So you know, <laughs> it's just what it's going to be. And I'll have to again, tie them back. But um, you, I have been surprised. It's so much of it is popping through the leaves, you know, growing past the stems that I did leave there. Um, and it's it, because it wants to live. And I think once you establish it, it's, it just takes care of itself. No matter that's what the, stupid things we do to it, it takes care of itself. That's the garden I want to have, the one that takes care of itself. <laughs> yes. I'll plant things like I have this native bee balm, and people go, gardeners will say, mm -hmm. oh, you don't want bee balm, that'll just take over. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I don't have to weed. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Mine has got, my habitat has just gotten so thick, I don't have any weeds. The only dandelions that do pop up in the spring are right along the edges. And, it, and they never take over. They don't have a chance. 
So I, you know, I think a lot of the no mo may uh, concept is about letting um, really the native pollinators have some shade and protection from taller grass that you will help if you do have grass, you're going to help with the drought resistance of that grass. But again, we have to keep in mind your basic turf grass has a what three to four inch root base. Yeah. So that native pollen, native plants do so much better at protecting themselves from drought. You know, some cities like in Ashland, they have their B city does a certification of your yard as a pollinator yard. Right. And then they have home tours. Mm -hmm. And last year they were all online because it was 2020. Yeah. And so people have concepts about, well, native plants aren't pretty or native plants right. are boring yeah. or I only want my grandmother's roses or something. And so if they can go and see what another yard's doing, right. uh, then they'd be more uh, susceptible to change. And at some point, the tipping point to me is then they become really proud of their garden, like you are of yours. Yeah, it's a happy mess. <laughs> and you can see it when the bees come out. <laughs> yes, yeah, and it's just, you have so many different pollinators and butterflies. I mean, if you like photography, it's great if you plant a pollinator habitat because you have so many insects and so much, and, and the bird song even, the, the amount of yellow finches that will come in at the end of the season, just eating all the uh, purple coneflower seeds. Mm. So it's, you know, it's a wonderful thing for people who have kids if they want to teach them about nature, but it's, it is um, that slow transition and getting to people to change from, again, these grass yards that do nothing for our communities. They just, they don't feed anything and they don't actually protect us from even mosquitoes. I mean, my habitat has helped to reduce the mosquito issue on my street because I have all these dragonflies and damselflies. Oh, very cool. You're yeah. a hero. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I live, as I said, between a bunch of cities, but we're an undeveloped area in the county. And the developers have been eyeing us for 25 years. And so we started an organization in 2006 called the Hamlet, which they're rare. There's not very many of them to try to advocate for ourselves, to get ourselves a seat at the table. And it was through doing land use that I discovered really the power of cities, what they can do. And so that's, it's like expanding pollinator gardens is cool, but getting cities with their resources, their parks, their open spaces, and all of the things that they do is like mega. You know, so that's why I think, and campuses too, I think that B-City and B-Campuses are a brilliant idea because that's like having, that's just how things get done is with cities. Yes. Well, and they have so much green space they aren't using, in including vacant lots, which True. they typically mow every week and they could save money and reduce their carbon footprint. And they wouldn't have so much stormwater runoff because the habitat is absorbing all of that water, all that standing water. So there are so many benefits. And, you know, I know as I work to make some changes in my own city, it's always about the money savings. It's it not just saving pollinators. So as you said, when you have to look at those benefits of the process, yes, it keeps you focused on having habitat, but look for those groups in your community, whether it's a local, um, you know, keep the city beautiful um, group or the master gardeners, but it's also the artists. It's the other environmental groups. There's so many, you know, even the League of Women Voters which uh, yeah. almost 10 years ago wrote a paper on the impact of pesticides. So they're, they too are concerned about the environment. So it's, it's amazing the different groups you can get involved. Yeah, if you just kind of sit down and start going through your Rolodex, you would be surprised. Right. <laughs> you know, so yeah. It, and now with the iron, if you're really into pollinators, you think everybody's into pollinators and now is the time that iron is hot, you know, and strike. Right. It's probably not that way in real life. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's gaining momentum. I think right. it's gaining some real speed. And so now is a really good time to be in the vanguard. Right. And I think even with the pandemic, you have so many cities that are realizing their uh, food deserts that they have, especially in mm. the older areas of their cities where there might be vacant lots that people want to turn into community gardens or even urban farms. And those urban farmers need pollinator habitat to help support the pollination of their crops. Yeah. 
So there are so many different groups and, and especially like in most communities, you've got immigrants moving in and many of them farmed in their native country. So they wanna do it over here. So the, again, it goes back to look at those alliances you can build across the community to support urban farming, to support a healthy landscape, to reduce stormwater runoff, to support pollinators, to have the beauty in your community, and to save money at the city from mowing lawns. Because yeah. that costs a lot of money. And, yeah. and using pesticides to control weeds, when all that does is damage the water system, kill things in the soil, and um, cost money, and puts those employees at risk because they're spraying pesticides. And then even like um, ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation, they have a native plant list. They plant natives and they plant freeway things and, and on ramps and stuff. And so larger organizations are involved. So I don't know how you can piggyback them in, but mm -hmm. maybe. Right. And we have that here in Ohio. A number of states have uh, plantings along their highways. I know North Carolina has a tremendous uh, planting. Um, and it, as you said, it's usually the on-ramps. It's not so that the pollinators are crossing freeways. We don't want to have monarch butterflies dead on our windshield. Ouch! <laughs> oh, yeah. So we want to keep them on the on-ramps and, and places where the, the butterflies and others have a place to go the other way away from moving cars. But it is an opportunity. There's all that land. Um, sometimes it, it's, uh, I know I have an on-ramp where the soil just slopes right down in the middle, it's horribly dangerous for anyone to mow it, then you should just plant it in habitat. Totally. Yeah. And, and if it's native, you know, it's just going to go through its cycle. You don't have to water it or anything. Right. Yeah, because eventually it will take care of itself. It will, it, if it wants to live, it will live. And the plants that can so survive the drought or too much water will figure out how to live. Right. Yeah. Well, I know that Xerces has some wonderful uh, publications that you can get at their website, especially on if you want to plant in your own yard, as well as to work through the Bee City process. And I encourage folks to check with um, Xerces website. It's easy to find, even if all you do is type in X-E-R-C-E-S. <laughs> that will get you to Xerces. Yeah, so, there's not a lot of that. <laughs> yes, yeah, they don't have a lot of competition in that one. Uh, so it's a wonderful site to go to for information about native plants and pollinators and how to reduce your pesticide use. It's got some great publications too on farming and uh, bringing pollinators into farming because we need our native bees for things like squashes. Those orchard bees are great for orchards and they could be of better use in almonds if the almond guys would plant more habitat because the orchard bees and things actually don't mind going out when it's foggy. Right, the honey orchard bees, bees are, are very nice because they don't stay out long. It's not like you have to plant a full year's worth of flowers for them. They're, they're gone in May. Right. In May. right, but you know, because the honey bees are so particular on the weather and it can be really, problematic some in California, but it, the native bee, um, they actually bounce around uh, more. They do better pollination and they go higher up in the trees. Uh, so we need them for even those big commercial areas, but we have to plant the food and the habitat for them. Definitely. They're starting to do that in vineyards here where they're planting pollinator habitat and uh, grapes are wind pollinated. They don't even need the pollinators, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but they're doing it just because it's a cool thing to do. Right. Well, and the thing is the yellow jackets come, the wasps come, and these are predators of pests. That's true. Yeah. And especially all those little parasitic wasps, the really tiny things. You see something flying around and until it lights on something, you still go, man, I've got bifocals. I can't see that thing at all. But those parasitic wasps are proving to be wonderful pest control but we've got to let them live. But most of them are soil dwellers too. Oh, even the wasps, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's amazing how all these insects have, have a place and we got to let everything live, but we got to provide their food for them again. It's true, very true. Well, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Carol. This has been ho hopefully inspiring for folks to make their own community or campus, a B City or B Campus USA. You can reach out to Carol or uh, just the Xerces Society. 
um, especially through the Bee City USA. You can also just type into your browser Bee City or Bee Campus USA and it will take you right to their website. And hopefully folks will take that after doing their own yard. They'll be inspired to take this to their city and expand that habitat opportunity for folks. We need millions of acres to help support our monarchs that come across our country uh, in their migration up toward Canada. So uh, it behooves us to plant our communities. So thank you very much, uh, Carol, very much. And uh, our next um, presentation will be on May 19th and we'll have Denise O'Brien who's going to talk about uh, pollinators and their value to urban farms and community supported agriculture. So we will see everyone in this series on May 19th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.